to, uh, to the 21st century. And so looking forward to that. Uh, it'll be end of May by the time we get to it, uh, the 21st century. But we'll, we'll start with the first century the next few weeks here. Uh, so we'll be in, in uh, New Testament times this week, next week, and the week after. So any questions, first off, quick questions I might need to be listening for or looking, looking at or thinking about? Jim, is this being recorded on? Will, will there be in theory, this, in theory, this is going to be on YouTube, but the computer is not cooperating right now. So we'll get that figured out. This first session may or may not get recorded properly because of that, John. But uh, okay, I'm asking for my sister. Right, right. And Jimmy, did you call your phone? Or? I literally just have a camera video recording off of my phone. Okay, so. But it's not on Zoom, but it is. You're, you're making a video recording. So we will have something on, on YouTube then, apparently. Jimmy is using a low-tech a low-tech, high-tech solution here. So, All right, well, the title of this, uh, as you can tell from the wonderful PowerPoint, which is not functioning, is uh, History of Christianity. And there are, of course, two words there. We've got Christianity and history. I want to talk about each of those words. So Christianity implies the followers of Christ. And so that's, that's an important piece to stipulate right off the bat. This is not um, some arbitrary movement. This is a movement focused on a person. Uh, and that person is Jesus the Christ. And I intentionally say Jesus the Christ, because Christ is not his surname. He is not Jesus Christ, son of Joseph Christ and Mary Christ. He is Jesus the Christ. It's the old joke, what do Attila the Hun and Winnie the Pooh and Jesus have in common? The same middle name, the. Uh, Christ is a title. Now the Romans garbled that up later and the Romans in persecution times actually thought Christ may have been a surname, but it's not. Uh, it is a title, which is one of the reasons I kind of like Paul sometimes. He sometimes inverts that and says Christ Jesus, which sounds a little odd to us, but it reminds us that Christ is the title. Christ is the Greek word for anointed. The Hebrew word is Messiah, Messiah. And so Jesus, Messiah, Messiah, Jesus, anointed one, Jesus, God's anointed. And in the uh, Old Testament, the people you would anoint usually were prophets or priests or kings. And the Christian movement would eventually come to say Jesus is a prophetic figure, a kingly figure, and certainly a priestly figure. Uh, they may not have decided all that on day one of the history of the church on the day of Pentecost, but eventually they came to see Jesus in all three of those anointed roles. So Jesus, we believe, fully lived into that identity as the anointed one. Best we can tell, as you can tell from slide four here, uh, best we can tell, Jesus was born probably between the year 6 and the year 4 B.C., which causes people no uh, end of confusion. B.C., doesn't B.C. mean before Christ? Uh, yes, it does. Well, then, by definition, how could Jesus be born before himself? Uh, well, here's the deal. Uh, the calendar that we use is was developed in around 525 by a guy named uh, Dennis the Dwarf, he was a monk, Dionysus Exiguus, Dennis the Shorter, Dennis the Dwarf. And, you know, we have calendars, we've got Google, we have a common era, but back then everything was dated on, this is the sixth year of the Emperor Tiberius, this is the third year of the Emperor Caligula. So just imagine going back 525 years, time of Columbus, uh, 1490s, uh, trying to figure out when Columbus sailed, if all you had with some scattered records of who the monarchs of England were and who the monarchs of Spain were and who the monarchs of France were. Uh, and you're trying to work backwards from your time, uh, counting backwards through all these records. I'm amazed he came that close. He came within five, within 1%, five, five to six years, four to six years out of 500. He nailed it uh, within 1% of being exactly correct uh, with horrible records. So. Um, let's cut some slides. So Jesus was born 4 to 6 BC, and the 4 is pretty hard because according to Matthew and Luke, uh, Jesus was born during the time of King Herod, and King Herod died in what we call 4 BC. So that's kind of the, 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 the tail end of when Jesus could be born. Uh, Jesus was probably crucified somewhere around 30 AD. There are some uh, scholars that estimate it may have been 33, but uh, the Passover began the evening of a Friday 
uh, M30 and M33. So those are both kind of prime candidates for when Jesus uh, died. So somewhere between 6 to 4 BC and 30 to 33 AD. That's kind of the range we're looking at for Jesus's life. All right, so that's the Christianity part, history of Christianity. Let's talk about history. And this is a little tough for us to understand and to wrap our 21st century minds around. History, as we understand the word, was not invented in Jesus' time. History, as we understand it, is a product of the Enlightenment movement, late 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, early 1900s, uh, until we got kind of to the postmodern period in the later part of the 20th, 20th century. And so the Romans and Greeks had an understanding of something they would consider history, but it doesn't line up with what we consider history to be. All right, so that needs a little bit of unpacking. So if you were a first century historian and you were writing down events, you had no no concept that you were trying to take a set of facts and present them without any kind of interpretation. Uh, that was not what things were about. We think of history, okay, we've got this data, we're trying to present this data. If I had a video camera and recorded these things, uh, this is what happened, these are the facts. Now we've pushed back on that since the Enlightenment times, since some of you may have grown up in the 1950s and 60s. We're in a postmodern period. And the postmodern period has its problems, but one good thing is that it acknowledges is that we all have biases. No historian can write the facts. The fact that you choose some facts to highlight means you're ignoring other facts. You are already putting your interpretation on the facts just by choosing something to write about. There is no unbiased witness. There is no unbiased history. And so we need to keep that in mind. And that certainly applies to what they understood history to be in the first century. The closest thing we have in our culture to what they thought of as history would be a movie based upon a true story or a movie inspired by true facts or maybe a historical novel. That's the way they thought of history in the first century. They didn't think of it as a bunch of facts. They thought of it as you telling a story about these characters who existed in history and the kinds of things they did. But if you needed to combine some characters, no big deal. If you needed to make something uh, conflate a little bit to tell the story and push the story forward, no big deal. The story was important because your goal was to inspire people. Your goal was to instruct people. Your goal was to get people to live in a certain kind of way based on the examples of these, these characters in the past. Now that's kind of a hard thing for us to wrap our mind around, but what do we do with history? That's, you know, that's what historians are trying to do. Uh, we're trying to inspire folks. And so that's very much uh, what they were about in the first century. Even the most uh, secular history of the first century was about inspiring, instructing, uh, getting you to live in a certain moral way. Right. Hey Mimi, good to see you. We're having some technical difficulties, but uh, this is what it is, so good to see you. All right, so that, that causes us some problems there. Um, and, and the Gospels have a little bit additional purpose. I mean, think, think about the Gospel of John for a second. John says point blank what his purpose is. His purpose is not to give you a complete list of every fact about Jesus ever known. He says, no, no, there are lots of other things Jesus did that are not written in this book. These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. John is writing about things that historically happened, but he's doing it with a purpose. Uh, Luke is trying to do the same thing. Luke is actually the most, the closest to a pure Greco-Roman historical historian type. But even he interprets things. Uh, Luke puts things in uh, a, an hourglass. Everything in Luke funnels to Jerusalem, and then everything in the book of Acts funnels out of Jerusalem. Uh, in John, Jesus is going to Jerusalem a bunch of times. Luke ignores that. Uh, he, he has everything funnel into Jerusalem and out. He's got his own purposes. Even though he's trying to write a history, it's a first century type of historical account. Let me pause real quick. Any, any thoughts or questions or pushback on that? Because that's an important concept. Later, as we get in the 
in the history of the Christian church, it becomes less and less important, but especially in the first century, that is hugely important for us to understand. Yeah. What does he say at the beginning of Luke? I can't remember how he phrases it. He's writing to a patron called Theophilus, and he says, many others have written, but I've tried to investigate these things uh, and give you an orderly account. Most excellent Theophilus. And it's an orderly account for a Gentile. And Luke is, you know, Mark and Matthew have more of a Jewish perspective. Luke is very much writing from a Gentile perspective. Again, another layer thrown on there. Uh, Luke makes sure uh, in the book of Acts, we'll talk about this in a couple weeks, that when Stephen is on trial, Stephen gives an entire summary of the Old Testament in about a chapter because Luke is writing to some people that might not know the Old Testament. They're not Jews. And so he slips in a wonderful summary of the Old Testament right then. And Stephen may have, may have said that, but that's not the important thing to Luke. It's uh, making sure to get that information in so that this audience can understand about Jesus. What are your thoughts here? All right, all right. So the question is, what historical sources do we have for Jesus? So I did this in my former church. There's a large parish library built of the library of three or four dead priests. Uh, and they had a huge room and lots of books. And so I would actually pull the books physically off the shelf. And I'd pull all the Christian writings from later centuries, uh, from the 400s and the 300s and the 200s and the 100s and the zeros. And I kind of laid them all out so people could see. And so from the 400s, the, the stack of Christian writings, and there were some anti-Christian writings too that the Romans would have. We'll, we'll talk about those uh, as we go on. But the stack of Christian writings from the 400s, yeah, it's about a six foot stack or so. Uh, from the 300s, pretty good stack, about four feet maybe. Uh, from the 200s, a couple of feet. Uh, from the 100s, about a, a foot of hardcover books. From the zeros, we have a stack of papers about yay big. Let me say that again. From the 100s, we have limited information. That information is basically two sheets of paper, two pages from a Jewish historian named Josephus. We'll talk about him more next week. And the writings that we preserve as the New Testament. That's all we've got. The writing, Jesus and the Christian movement did not hit the radar screen of Roman historians in the Roman Empire by and large until the 100s, 200s, 300s. Uh, and we'll talk, there are some, actually some uh, Roman historians at the turn of the century that write about Jesus. We'll talk about them uh, next week and what they say about Jesus. But if you take out the New Testament, you've got basically two references to Jesus in one Jewish Roman historian, Josephus. So the New Testament is hugely important for our historical understanding of what happens in the first century about who Jesus is. Without the New Testament, um, there's really no way of knowing who Jesus is. Uh, and so it becomes vitally important. Now here is a challenge. We live in a time when um, there is a wide spectrum of New Testament scholarship. And there's been a lot of pushback about how historically reliable the New Testament writings are. Well, these guys, are they really writing what actually happened? Are they writing based on eyewitness testimony and recollections? Or are they just making everything up? Uh, are they just trying to invent a religion? That's a charge. Uh, that's a charge against Paul at times. That Jesus was a teacher, but Paul invented Christianity. Paul made him the Christ figure. Uh, Nate, will you drop the temperature a couple degrees in here, please? I don't know if anybody else is a little warm, but maybe I'm just moving around. So we have a wide spectrum of opinion on that. And your view of the reliability of the New Testament will determine your view of the history of the first uh, 100 years of the Christian movement. And it will very much determine your view of Jesus in some ways, if that makes sense. Now, all of us have biases. I'll share my biases in a minute. But um, there is a wide variety of scholarship. So, for example, anybody heard of a guy named Thomas Jefferson? Of course. All right. Jefferson, being an Enlightenment man, did not like the idea of miracles. He thought that was later accretions. He thought Jesus was a great moral teacher. Uh, but he also thought that anything miraculous should not be regarded as important. And so Jefferson sat down with two Bibles and the, the 18th century equivalent of an exacto knife, 
and he would cut out Jesus's teachings and paste them into a new Bible. And he had to have two Bibles because you know, you'd, if you cut on the odd numbered pages, that might mess up the back. And so he has odd pages and even pages and he would slice this out. You can go on Amazon uh, and buy a copy of the Jefferson Bible. It contains Jesus's teachings and none of Jesus's miracles. No resurrection. Jesus dies on the cross and is buried. That's it for Thomas Jefferson. Uh, no healings, no uh, nothing miraculous, no walking on water, no resurrection. Uh, Jesus is a teacher who gets killed. All right, there are still scholars who are of that mindset. You may have heard this is a group that was famous in the 90s, 80s and 90s. They got a lot of press called the Jesus Seminar. I don't have time to go into all the ins and outs about them, but they were very skilled in trying to uh, get media coverage. They wanted to be in Time Magazine. They wanted to be interviewed for documentaries. And there were about 70 scholars in this seminar. Um, really, there were only a couple of big hitters. The rest of the guys were fairly minor. And in fact, one of them was a movie director, the guy that directed RoboCop and uh, Basic Instinct, Paul Verhoeven. <laughs> I'm not, I still to this day, I'm not sure how the heck he got as part of their group. But what they decided to do is they would sit in judgment on every verse of the New Testament and they would vote on it and majority would rule. And the way they voted, uh, we believe Jesus said this, or we believe Jesus said something that was kind of like this, or this really doesn't sound like something Jesus would say, or we're definitely sure this should not be regarded as historical in the New Testament. And they went through the entire New Testament, and or the entire the four Gospels, and you can see what they thought was good and what they thought was bad. They had uh, a set of biases, and part of their biases were similar to Jefferson's. Nothing miraculous is probably true. Uh, well, if you cut out the miraculous in the New Testament, then you've cut out an enormous chunk of things. Um, there were some criteria. They had about 14 criteria. I don't have them all up here, but you know, one of them that's actually good is the criterion of embarrassment. If something was embarrassing to the early church, and yet it made it into the New Testament, it probably was true. Uh, well, that makes sense. Uh, you know, Peter denied Jesus. That's embarrassing. Why would we want to share that? Well, probably because it actually happened. You wouldn't make, if you're going to make something up, you wouldn't make up something embarrassing unless you were just so brilliant. Well, 2,000 years from now, somebody will look at a criterion of embarrassment, so I'm going to make up something. No. Uh, if it's something embarrassing, it's probably, probably true. That's, that's a great thing. I mean, the, the fact that women were in the empty tomb. Women were not regarded as reliable witnesses. Why would you make that up? Makes no sense, unless they actually were women at the end of the tomb. Yeah, Trey. I was going to ask how they dealt with the women at the tomb. Well, you know, um, they, they, they also had 13 other criteria, and so they had some, and, and their biases are very clear. I don't want to waste too much time on them, because their biases do heavily influence uh, what the outcome was. The outcome was basically predetermined based on the 14 filters that they set up before they went in. So. We, we do see that. Uh, they were part of a group called the Historical Jesus Movement. And here's the problem with the Historical Jesus Movement. It's a sword that cuts two ways. There are parts of it that are wonderful and parts of it that are very dangerous, in my humble opinion. The wonderful thing is we have learned more in the 20th century and now in the 21st century about the context of first century Israel than any Christian has known in the entire history of the Christian church, except for the folks who actually lived back then. And, and we're part of that. We have a depth of knowledge that we have gained in the past hundred years about what Jesus's context, what his nation was like, what his people were like, what his culture was like, in much deeper ways than the people in the 1800s or 1700s or any other era did. That part- Because of archeology? span Archeology is part of that, and also digging out obscure manuscripts, and, and we've discovered some caches of manuscripts and things like that. Uh, and so that's helped enormously. Uh, but yeah, archaeology has not hurt on, on that score either. So that is very helpful to know Jesus's context. But if you do not regard the New Testament as a reliable witness, and you exclude large portions of that, and then try to figure out who Jesus is, it's kind of a Rorschach test. Uh, you kind of ink blot. So you know, what, what's your interpretation? Well. It turns out, if you don't have the New Testament kind of as a guideline, um, these scholars that write about who they think Jesus is, one <coughs> scholar on the other side said, basically it looks like them. 
Uh, Jesus always turns out to resemble very closely whatever writer is writing about him. If you discard the New Testament, uh, then you want to see Jesus to be just like you. And, and so they tend to do that. So that part of historical Jesus stuff, I think, is heavily problematic. All right. Uh, a line you might also hear uh, is the Jesus of history versus the Christ of faith. They would talk about that dichotomy, that the Christ idea was later uh, retrojected by the later Christian church. Uh, we need to get back to the real Jesus uh, before, before all these other folks started monkeying with him. Um, there's been some wonderful pushback on this. I have a book called uh, The Historical Christ and the Jesus of Faith. It turns that idea right on its head and it says, and I won't go through the argument because that's the argument. Uh, but the idea is that basically most of what we have in the New Testament is, is reliable. And we have nothing better that we could uh, use. Uh, for better or for worse, we, we've, got to, we've got to stick with the New Testament accounts and basically trust them. If you start to get uh, to, if you sit in judgment over the New Testament accounts and you get to pick and choose, then it's hard to say anything about what happened, anything about who Jesus is. All right, so having said that, history is biased. That's a postmodern idea. And so my interpretation of who Jesus is is going to be based on my biases. Uh, here are Jim Haney's biases. One, uh, the New Testament is not a modern history or an enlightenment history as in trying to present the facts. But I would also say that it is reliable historical information. Now, having said that, you do have issues at times. How many women were at the tomb? Well, there are different lists in the different Gospels. How many angels were at the tomb when they got there? There are different accounts in different Gospels. Um, when did the cleansing of the temple happen? In John, it happens at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it happens at the end. Um, so I can kind of be agnostic about some things. When did the cleansing of the temple happen? Well, John puts it here for various theological reasons. Matthew, Mark, and Luke put it here for various theological reasons. Um, I would trust that that happened, uh, that that is an accurate account. Uh, where it slots in the, in the uh, New Testament, eh, you know, that, that kind of thing could be up for debate because actually what the early church was, was dealing with, uh, you've got all these oral histories, but nobody sat down uh, and transcribed and wrote down uh, a daily calendar of what Jesus said on what day. The nearest thing I can uh, liken it to is Christmas tree ornaments. When you go to set up your Christmas tree every year, you reach in the box and you grab uh, the Batman ornament and you put it on this branch. Uh, we've got kiss ornaments. Uh, you know, you grab the King Simmons ornament on this branch. Uh, you, you pick up the baby's first Christmas ornament. Now, the next year, those ornaments may be in different spots on the tree, but they're the same ornaments. The different Gospels might have things arranged in different ways, but the essence of it, the, the testimony of it's the same, whether it's on this branch, this branch, this branch, whether the whether Matthew's trying to make this point with it or Mark's trying to make this point with it or Luke's trying to make this point with it, it still is these nuggets are the same all the way across or similar or if that makes sense. So that's a bias of mine. I will readily admit to that. Um, I also admit one thing that there's pushback on is how can we trust the New Testament? It was written by Christians. They are um, biased. They have an agenda, so we really can't trust it. Uh, my pushback on that accusation is to say, if I was writing a biography of Abraham Lincoln, I might look at the writings of William Seward, his secretary of, which secretary was it, state? Um, I might look at Seward's writings. Um, if I applied that criteria, well, Seward worked for Lincoln, he knew Lincoln, he uh, wants to make Lincoln look good, so I can't trust anything William Seward says about Lincoln because uh, he was too close. Well, we're not going to do that. We're going to look at uh, Seward, and we're going to look at Stanton and Lincoln's other cabinet members and try to get a fuller picture of who Lincoln is through them. And so I reject that kind of uh, reasoning that we can't use the New Testament for historical information. Plus, and this is a faith statement, uh, I do believe the Holy Scriptures are the Word of God, and they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so I believe that we have in Scripture what God wants us to have. Uh, and for better or for worse, uh, you know, that's, that's a bias that I have. 
I'm not coming to the scriptures with an idea that Jim Haney needs to sit in judgment and decide which things are true and which things aren't. Uh, I believe God has given us that gift of scripture. Um, and that's what we've got. And that's what we need to work with. Okay, real quick. Um, I had some wonderful maps I was going to show on the PowerPoint, but we'll, we'll get that up and running and figure it out for next week. Uh, but just a, a quick couple things. For those of you who are part of the Old Testament class last year, a couple things. We kind of got up into the New Testament times, kind of right up to the edge of that. Uh, just a few things of the historical context that Jesus is growing up in that tie back to our study of the Old Testament era. Uh, Jesus was born into the kingdom of King Herod. Herod was not an independent king. Herod was a vassal client king of the Roman Empire. Uh, by the time Jesus was born, the Roman Empire controlled uh, what we would call Israel. Uh, so he was born in the time of King Herod. Uh, as he was an adult, uh, Herod's sons had, some of them had mismanaged uh, their inheritance from Herod. And a couple of them were in charge of different areas. And a couple of them had been replaced by the Romans with their own governors. So we get a situation in Jesus' New Testament context where Herod, uh, Herod Antipas is in charge in the north and along the Jordan River, in Galilee and along the Jordan River, but Judea and Jerusalem is under the control of Roman governors. Uh, at Jesus' time, it's Pontius Pilate. We'll say more about him uh, next week. So in his adulthood, you have kind of this split uh, jurisdictional uh, issue. You've got, they, they both work for the Romans, but one is a Roman governor and one is a client vassal king. One thing we don't often think of, Jesus grew up in an extremely cosmopolitan world. We looked at that last time. By the time Jesus was born, uh, Alexander had swept through uh, what we call Israel and Egypt and Persia and into India, and he had left this vast swath of Hellenized Greek culture. They had been there by Jesus' time for three centuries, more than three centuries. And so there were heavy Greek-speaking areas right near where Jesus was. Just, in fact, across the Lake of Galilee, there are cities of the Decapolis. You sometimes see them mentioned in the Gospel. Those are Greek city-states, Greek-speaking. Uh, Bethsaida in Galilee, uh, right on the edge. It's a border town, and it's got a heavy Greek uh, influence to it. Uh, also, you've got a couple Roman enclaves in Galilee. Galilee, by the way, is about the size of Lubbock County. About 350,000 people crammed into Lubbock County, more rurally. They're in villages. They're not in a lot of large cities. There are a couple cities of 20, 25,000, uh, Tiberias and, uh, and Sepphoris. Uh, those are actually both Roman enclaves. And one of them is just five miles from Nazareth, basically next hill over. So Jesus grew up with Greeks nearby, with Romans right there. Jesus probably spoke a fair amount of Greek. Uh, the Romans probably communicated with the Jews in Greek, but that's another story. Uh, so it's a very cosmopolitan world. We don't we think of it, oh, he grew up in the sticks and the boonies. Well, it is on the edge of the Roman Empire, but there are Mediterranean cultural influences that are heavy uh, in that part of the world. We also talked at the end last year about the four uh, groups that have come down to us as parties of Judaism, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and the Zealots. Part of that comes from Josephus, a part of that comes from the New Testament. Uh, but we have these, these parties in Judaism. Uh, the Sadducees were a small group, but they were the wealthy elite, and they were in charge of the temple. And so they were very much tied into that. Uh, the Pharisees were a lay group that was spread out. Uh, they favored having synagogues and having people study uh, the law themselves. Uh, the Essenes were kind of a weird bunch. They dropped out of society and hid out in a monastery on the Dead Sea. We would not know anything about them except their library was discovered in 1948 by accident, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Otherwise, they've been pretty much a footnote in history. But they've become hugely important because we got their writings, uh, for better or for worse. Some of them are weird. But some of them are really cool, like the oldest copy of Isaiah we have. Uh, it pushed the oldest copy of Isaiah centuries earlier because uh, we found one that they had. Wow. And then there's a group called the Zealots that were anti-Roman, and uh, some of them favored uh, terroristic uh, tactics against the Romans. So we, we have these uh, groups that we, we talked about at the end last time uh, that are part of Judaism. All right, well, 
Uh, next time, we're, we're hitting up on 10 here. I want to be able to finish by 10.05, so I want to leave a couple minutes for questions. Next time, I do want to look at the first century writings of Josephus, what they say about Jesus. Um, also, some writings from an early Roman historian that wrote in the early 100s, 116-ish, uh, Tacitus, uh, what he says about Jesus, and also what the Gospels say about Jesus. And so that's my goal for next time. Uh, but for three minutes here, questions or, or thoughts or comments here? Yeah, Mark. Uh, <clears throat> this might be a little complex issue to answer in three minutes or whatever, but uh, New Testament writers are often making use of the Old Testament, basically like on every page they're drawing from their scriptures to explain what Jesus is doing and why it's important. But I, I feel like I've run into a lot of times biblical scholars will find those connections and sort of that absolves any sort of uh, tie to history that they would want to have. So like if they're, you know, if it's a miracle that looks like Jesus walking on the water and there's this reference in Job that says God walks on the water, right. it becomes less important to to root that historically because it seems like they're just drawing from the Old Testament to say Jesus is God. You know, and, and one of the places that really hits heavily, I mean, that's, that's one, but in, in the Passion of Jesus, um, Psalm 22 and the Servant Songs in Isaiah, the second part of Isaiah, uh, chapter 40 through uh, 55, um, one could say, if one was a high skeptic, uh, that the later church has made that stuff up to make Jesus match those, uh, those prophetic writings. Uh, and you know, some people would say Jesus chose to do these things uh, in order to fulfill those writings. And that's, that's an argument you might be able to make. But some of them, like Jesus being buried in a, a rich man's tomb, uh, he had no control over that being dead. Uh, and so you know, I'm a little, I, I push back against some of that. But that is certainly uh, something that does get used, Mark. Um, now, the Old Testament is used more by some writers than others. Matthew quotes the Old Testament a lot more than Luke will. Uh, you know, Hebrews and Revelation use it a lot. Paul uses it a lot. Paul quotes it from memory. Occasionally, when these guys are all quoting from memory, actually, occasionally they get things a little garbled, because, you know, I've, I've had people quote movies back to me. Play it again, Sam, in Casablanca. Well, Bogey never said that. Play it, Sam. Uh, play it as time goes by. Uh, you know, never play it again, but we, we, we get these. So there are a few times when things get slightly misquoted, but the essence of the Old Testament quote is correct in the New Testament. Uh, and so, you know, I give that a grain of salt because uh, they're going by memory and not by uh, actually looking it up on a computer and copying and pasting and uh, inserting it in the document. So that's, that's a good question, Mark. Yeah, Bob, you have some. One of my listeners this morning is uh, you ever listen to morning prayer or evening prayer on Alexa, on Amazon. Uh, one of today's lessons was the portion from Acts where Gamaliel says, well, if, if this is the real deal, we're, we better leave them alone. And if it's not, nobody's going to remember it. And the reality is the various other revolutionary movements, nobody, other than Masada and, and Markukla, et cetera, nobody ever remembers the other Messiah. And we'll talk about this next week. Uh, when those other revolutionary movements got put down, there were a lot of them. Jesus was on a one-off in Israel. Uh, Messiahs would rise up frequently. Uh, not every you know, two hours, but uh, you know, every year, every couple, three years, uh, there'd be a Messianic movement. And all of them, when you cut off the head, the movement ended unless a brother or a son picked up the mantle and assumed the role. We'll talk about that next week. Christianity is unique in that the leader is killed and the movement continues. Uh, and the, the followers say very clearly, the reason we don't need another leader is because he is still around. Uh, he is risen. Uh, he is exalted to heaven. Yeah. Real quick, Trevor. Um, what do the skeptics say about the original people, you know, gospel writers and such, pushing this information, this movement, when all they did was bring the authorities down on them? Why would they keep doing that? Maybe for their own personal power, their own self-aggrandizement, to make themselves important in the movement. Uh, I, I don't buy that argument at all, but that is something you get. But I mean, it, it all ended badly for all of them. That's like the other perspective. Yes, yes. 
So again, you know, as our book said very clearly, we'll talk about this next week too. Um, if you ignore the resurrection, if you ignore the miraculous, you've got a big historical hole. How the heck did the church gain traction and expand as quickly as it did without something like the resurrection happening? That actually puts the pressure on them to explain that they, they, they've got to really go through a lot of convolutions. It's, I don't find their arguments convincing, obviously, because I don't buy their arguments. So until Constantine was emperor, it was a bad idea to join the church. You know, you, you were not joining it for social advancement right. until after the 300s. Uh, you ran the risk of being killed. You ran the risk of being looked down upon. Uh, and we'll talk more about that as we get to future centuries. Okay, y'all, we better stop here because we got to get the computer uh, hooked into Zooming. And hopefully, hopefully next week uh, we'll get things working better and the PowerPoint up and running. But uh, Jimmy's got a week to get that, get that figured out. So thank you all, and uh, we'll see you later. It says it recorded, Dad. It says it recorded, but I don't know. It said recorded? Yeah, but I also did the...